Hong Dunbar to the Philadelphia Free Library. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of, of thank yous to give uh, before we start this evening. And uh, of course, the first thank you needs to go to the library. Uh, this is an important place. Libraries um, helped me become the scholar that I am today. It was the place where I learned to get lost in a book um, and, and also to spend a lot of time researching in order to write books. Uh, so I'm appreciative of the library for having me here this evening. Uh, and I need to thank, uh, of course, Dr. Patrick Oates and Evelyn Sample Oates for um, having a lovely reception and welcoming me here tonight um, to share this project, this, this work that I've been doing for <laughs> what is now almost, well, too many years really to, to express. Um, and uh, also, before I, I sort of start, I'd like, I have sort of various people here. Um, my family, of course, who've traveled, some who've traveled, my parents, my husband's son, they were, they've taken up all the seats, and uh, uncles and cousins, um, so thank you all. And, and folks from other, sort of all my different walks of life, um, from when I was a student at Germantown Friends School, um, parents of my, uh, my son, uh, of his friends, and so there's so many people here, and I thank you all uh, for coming out tonight. And let me start by saying Happy Black History Month, right? <laughs> happy Black History Month. We are um, we're approaching, of course, the end of February. I had no idea when um, we talked about the, the sort of publication date for this book. Um, I sort of had no idea that uh, what was what is happening uh, sort of would be happening, and uh, we thought, oh, it's a, it's a good idea to, to sort of bring this book out um, in February. So it's only been out uh, now two weeks, and this actually is my Philadelphia debut of the book. I've been uh, around a lot of places, so it's special to me to be here and home, um, sharing this this work, this important story. Um, it's February, it's Black History Month. Next month is March, Women's History Month. Um, and so it's a sort of an important moment to bring out this work. Of course, it's also uh, President's Day, or at least was President's Day. Um, and really, and I've said this before, I, I can't really think of a better moment to tell the story of a 22-year-old black woman who resisted the President of the United States. I think, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a story that I think many of us are interested in and perhaps can even connect to in certain ways. So what I'll do to this evening is I'll read a little bit. I'll read a little bit from the book. I'll talk a little bit about um, sort of how I came to write this text, and I'll also try to sort of put us in the moment um, of the early national period when this nation was being founded um, and to, to bring us to the, the sort of collision of the lives of, of Ona Judge, of George Washington, and of Martha Washington. About 20 years ago, I was, um, it's been that long, working on uh, really my dissertation in my first book, and I was at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania uh, down on Locust Street. And I came across uh, an advertisement. And it was an advertisement for a runaway slave from the president's house. And her name was Oni Judge, or at least they called her Oni Judge. And I thought, wait a minute. Oni Judge, the president's house, a runaway slave. Why don't I know this story? Here I am, supposedly an expert or becoming an expert on early African American women's history, and I had never heard this name, never knew this story, uh, and I told myself I needed to come back to this. Um, I thought about sort of including it in my first book, 
but there really just was no room, and I really wanted to give her, own a judge, um, her due. So I came back to her, finished the first book, came uh, back to the second book. And when I began, I never, I didn't really know if there was going to be enough to write a book. I figured, well, why has nobody done this yet? And then after sort of years of research, I realized it's hard, right? She was a fugitive, and she wanted to remain undetected for the majority of her life. So she left little in the way of clues. And so it really took sort of painstaking work, uh, pulling on the threads of history to try and uncover her life. And what I will say also is writing my first book, A Fragile Freedom, helped me to fill in the gaps. All too often, black women in particular are silenced in the archives. We are not there, especially during this time period, in part because Many of us could not read or write, were enslaved, were women, were not even counted by a name in the census, just our bodies. And for that reason, it becomes very difficult to find shards of evidence that are written by or about black women. And so the work that I did in my first book, which kind of unraveled the lives of African-American women in the North helped me to fill in the gaps. So sometimes I don't have a document that says, Ona Judge ate this for breakfast. Um, I don't know what she had for breakfast, but I know what people normally ate in New Hampshire for breakfast. I know how long it took to bake bread in the 19th century. So I can fill in those gaps with what I know, and that's what I've done with Never Caught. I, uh, as I said, I sort of vowed to return to her life, and I feel incredibly sort of honored to be the person to kind of recover her history and to share her now with the world. You know, she was a fugitive uh, for many, many years, for over half a century, but one thing I'm certain, she never wanted to be forgotten. And so it's, a, it's an honor to tell her story. Tonight I'll give you a little bit of context, show some slides, and as I said, I'll also read from the book. Spring rain drenched the streets of Philadelphia in 1796. Weather in the city of brotherly love was often fickle at this time of year vacillating between extreme cold and oppressive heat. But rain was almost always appreciated in the nation's capital. It erased the putrid smells of rotting food, of animal waste and filth that permeated the cobblestone roads of the new nation. It reminded Philadelphians that the long and punishing winter was behind them. Spring rain cleansed the streets and souls of Philadelphians, ushering in optimism and hope and a feeling of rebirth. And in the midst of the promises of spring, Ona Judge, a young, black, enslaved woman, received devastating news. She learned that she was to leave Philadelphia a city that had become her home. Judge was to travel back to Virginia and prepare herself to be bequeathed or given away to her owner's granddaughter. So today I introduce one of the most understudied fugitive slaves in America. The age of 22, Judge literally stole herself from the Washingtons facing the president to show his slave-catching hand. As a fugitive, Judge would test the president's will, his reputation. The most important man in the nation, heralded with winning the American Revolution, could not reclaim his family's enslaved woman. Ona Judge did what no one else could do. She beat the president. Judge was never caught. 
I introduce a new hero, a slave girl raised at Mount Vernon. This is an image of Mount Vernon much later, 1872. Some of the first images of Mount Vernon uh, or we, we kind of have from the 1850s. Um, but I at least, I understand this is much later, but I wanted you to sort of see the space, the, the mansion house where she served, uh, even though this was some time later. She was a slave girl raised at Mount Vernon who once exposed to the ideas of freedom was compelled to pursue it at any cost. This was a woman who found the courage to defy the president, the wit to find allies, to escape, to out-negotiate, to run, to survive. Her story is the only existing account of a fugitive once held by the Washingtons. And we believe it's the only fugitive account from a, Ford, uh, from a fugitive slave in 18th century Virginia. Judge's life exposes the sting of slavery, the drive of defiance. She guarded what she believed or called her freedom every day of her life, never regretting her decision to fight for what she believed to be her right, and that was freedom. In 1789, Washington was elected the first president of the United States. This is actually an image um, from the Schomburg's collection, digital collection of um, Federal Hall, which is where actually Washington took uh, the oath of office in 1789. I recently wrote a little article um, for Time magazine about um, first ladies. And um, what's interesting about this image uh, is that it gives us an idea of where he stood kind of on this balcony, but he was alone when he took the oath of office. Martha was not with him. She was a reluctant first lady, another thing that might sound somewhat familiar. <laughs> so Washington traveled alone uh, to New York and uh, to the nation's first capital. Eventually, Martha would join him and she would bring seven enslaved people from Mount Vernon with them. Ona Judge was one of them. In some ways, it was like bringing a little bit of home uh, from Virginia to New York. Ona would be taken from her mother, Betty, and her other siblings that remained in Virginia. I'm gonna read a little bit from the book, this sort of moment when uh, Ona leaves Virginia, leaves her everything that she knows. The young Ona judge was far from an experienced traveler. The teenager knew only Mount Vernon and its surroundings and had never traveled far from her family and loved ones. For judge, the, must, the move must have been similar to the dreaded auction block. Although she was not sold to a different owner, she was forced to leave her family for an unfamiliar destination hundreds of miles away. Judge would have no choice but to stifle the terror she felt and to go on about the work of preparing to move, folding linens, packing Martha Washington's dresses and her accessories, helping with the grandchildren were the tasks at hand and it wasn't her place to complain or question. Judge had to remain strong and steady. If not for herself, then for her mistress who appeared to be falling apart at the seams. Like Judge, Martha Washington had no choice about the move to New York. Her life was at the direction of her husband the most powerful man in the country. Mrs. Washington and Ona Judge may have shared similar concerns, but of course only Martha Washington was allowed to express discontent and sorrow. Martha Washington was unhappy and everyone knew it, including her frightened slave. The president's nephew, Robert Lewis, would also soon be made aware of it. When he arrived at the estate on May 14th, things were in disarray. 
Lewis, who served as Washington's secretary between 1789 and 91, was chosen to escort his aunt and her grandchildren to New York, but was surprised and a bit concerned when he arrived to find a frenzied and hectic scene, Lewis wrote, quote, everything appeared to be in confusion, end quote. The manifestation of Mrs. Washington's conflicting feelings. Robert Lewis described the departure, which finally took place on May 16, 1789, as an emotional moment for the slaves and the first lady. Quote, after an early dinner, and making all necessary arrangements in which we were greatly retarded, it brought us to three o'clock in the afternoon when we left Mount V. The servants of the house and a number of the field Negroes made their appearance to take leave of their mistress. Numbers of these poor wretches seemed greatly agitated, much affected, my aunt equally so. Betty, Ona Judge's mother, must have been one of those agitated slaves. Not only was she losing her 16-year-old daughter, but she was also losing her son, Austin, who would serve as one of the Washington's waiters. Austin's wife, Charlotte, and their children would have joined in the morning. Betty watched her children leave Mount Vernon a reminder of what little control slave mothers had over the lives of their children. If she found any comfort that day, it would have been that brother and sister were traveling together. Austin was older and male and could look out for his younger sister. Still, Betty knew that her relationship with her children would never be the same. The Washingtons, as I said, took seven enslaved people, uh, five men, two women. Ona was one of them to New York, but they stayed only a short period of time. For those of you who've seen the, the sort of Broadway splash, Hamilton, there's a conversation about how the, the nation's capital eventually moves or the bargains made to, to bring it to Philadelphia. And in November of 1790, the nation's capital switched to this city. Ona would live in Philadelphia until 1796. Let me uh, take you to early national Philadelphia. This is an image uh, of what we call the President's House. For those of you, I'm sure you all are familiar with uh, the Liberty Bell and the sort of um, replica of where the, the President's House stood. This is where Ona would spend uh, six or so years uh, really coming of age in Philadelphia. February 1796 brought a palpable unease to the president's house. A thick tension prompted Ona Judge and her enslaved companions to tread lightly around George and Martha Washington. Enslaved men and women always moved about their days with caution, not knowing what events could sour or sweeten an owner's mood. For the slaves who resided within the same walls as their owner, life could be akin to walking through fields embedded with landmines. The smallest of matters, such as the accidental breaking of a dish, or inconveniently timed bad weather could alter the disposition of an owner. Although the president did not earn the reputation of being a violent or particularly physically punishing slave owner, he did on occasion lose his temper. Ona Judge maneuvered through her daily tasks at the president's house with a smooth watchfulness, perhaps attending to Martha Washington with extra care as she helped her dress for the day. For seven years, Judge served her mistress well up north. She became Martha Washington's closest body slave. All who knew the Washingtons on a personal level 
were familiar with Judge. Judge, she accompanied her mistress on social calls. She was a recognizable face. Judge understood her mistress, and she knew just how much Martha Washington loved her grandchildren. Martha had outlived every single one of her children fathered by her first husband. Martha Washington had no choice but to look towards her grandchildren for hope and enjoyment. And although she was only 27 years old when she married George Washington, their marriage never yielded offspring, a subject that must have been difficult for both the president and his wife to accept. After the death of one of her sons, she actually accepts two of his children uh, into the home, and basically they raise grandchildren. So it's kind of an interesting to think about sort of intergenerational assistance in raising kids. You know, we sort of think about it now in the 21st century with grandmothers helping to raise children. Well, we see it in the president's house um, in the 18th century as well. So they raise two of her son's children up through adulthood. Judge must have witnessed the shock and concern of her owners after they read through the mail on February 6th. The president received a letter from Eliza, his 19-year-old step-granddaughter, informing her grandparents of her intention to marry. Eliza wrote of her engagement to a man named Thomas Law, a British businessman who had come to America in 1794. He was sort of involved in land development and speculation around what would become the federal city. Law met Eliza, who was 20 years his junior, and a romance turned into an engagement very quickly. Eliza's father was deceased, so George Washington stood as an appropriate surrogate type to approve or reject the marriage. The news sent the executive mansion into a tailspin. And although this was very personal business, everyone who lived within the walls of the president's house knew exactly what was happening. Neither George nor Martha Washington knew about the seriousness of the relationship between Thomas Law and Eliza, and there was much to be concerned about. Aside from him being 20 years older, that was sort of kind of normal for that moment in time. He had spent a good amount of time in India and arrived in America with two of his three children, two biracial children, Indian and British, his biracial children and his age most certainly raised the eyebrows of the Washingtons. Ona watched her owners feel their way through the dramatic events of 1796. And the First Lady's concerns must have turned to optimism, for by the end of the month, Martha Washington began to publicly announce this kind of upcoming matrimony. At first, she's upset. George Washington eventually writes back to Eliza and to Thomas Law, accepting their marriage, a sort of lukewarm acceptance. But by the end of the month, Martha's sort of come around. She's announcing it to her friends and acquaintances. And Ona Judge had no idea that the acceptance of the marriage between Eliza Law, the granddaughter, and Thomas Law would begin the unraveling of her life. Eliza Park Custis married Thomas Law on March 21st, and the marriage signaled the beginning of major changes in the Washington's household and for their slaves. Judge most certainly knew by this time Washington had made the decision he would not run for a third term in office. So everyone at the executive mansion knew that their lives would change soon, that they would return to Virginia. The idea of reconnecting with loved ones at Mount Vernon must have given some of the enslaved reason to celebrate. But Judge had lived in the North for seven years, 
and the thought of returning to Mount Vernon did not settle well. A return to Mount Vernon was a reminder to judge and her enslaved companions that they were considered the property of another person. And after living in a relatively free northern city, this was a difficult concept to swallow. For Ona Judge, the uncertainty vanished as her fate was revealed. The marriage of Eliza Custis and a change in circumstances would cut Judge's residency in Philadelphia short. Unlike the other enslaved people who lived at the executive mansion, Ona Judge would not return to Philadelphia from her annual summer trip. Judge would not be around to witness the president's final months in office. Why was that? Martha Washington's deep concern for Eliza trumped any relationship she may have forged with Judge. She sensed that Eliza had moved into this relationship for which she was completely unprepared. And the only thing she could think to do was to give Eliza the support and guidance or assistance, the best support she could offer. She would give Ona Judge to Eliza. Although Judge had earned the top spot among Martha Washington's personal slaves, there was no way for Judge to amass enough personal or emotional capital to convince her owner to change her mind. Judge's fate was now in the hands of Eliza Custis Law, a woman who was approximately the same age as Ona and who was known for having a difficult and volatile temper. I use this image for a reason. This was Ona's fate and a shift to the household of the volcanic and irritable Eliza Custis Law would most likely doom Judge to a life of poor treatment and uncertainty. And she made a decision. She simply wouldn't let that happen. This transition to this woman's household was the trigger for Ona to leave. She made a decision. She would run away. I'll read another passage briefly. Judge knew what the future held should she not heed the advice of her free black associates. She later stated in an interview, she supposed if she went back to Virginia, she should never have the chance to escape. Once she learned that upon the decease of her master or mistress, she would become the property of a granddaughter of theirs by the name of Custis, she knew that she had to flee. She imagined that her work for the laws would begin immediately, not after the death of her owners, prompting a fierce clarity about her future and her dislike for Eliza Custis. She was determined never to be her slave. Her decision was made. She would risk everything to avoid the clutches of the new Mrs. Law. Judge was well informed and knew that her decision to flee was far more than risky. But she was willing to face dog sniffing kidnappers and bounty hunters for the rest of her life. Yes, her fear was consuming, but so too was her anger. Judge could no longer stomach her enslavement, and it was the change in her ownership that pulled the trigger on Judge's fury. She had given everything to the Washingtons. For 12 years, she had served her mistress faithfully, and now she was to be discarded like the scraps of the material that she cut from Martha Washington's dress. Any false illusions she had clung to had evaporated. And Judge knew that no matter how obedient or loyal she may have appeared to her owners, she would never be considered fully human. 
her fidelity meant nothing to the Washingtons. She was their property to be sold, mortgaged, or traded with whomever they wished. So she makes the decision to flee. And this was one of the ads that I came across um, more than 20 years ago that introduced her escape. And you know, when I first looked at the advertisement, I thought, okay, George, really? You're like advertising for, a you're the president. Like, you know, there are 300 more people back at Mount Vernon who you claim, you and Martha Washington, and actually Martha was the, the person who had owned the majority of enslaved people. When George married Martha, he kind of came up financially because Martha had the money from her first marriage and uh, in wealth in enslaved people. So when I first saw this advertisement, I thought, wow, how interesting, how different, how wild. And then after a lot of other researching, I realized this wasn't the first time that Washington had advertised for a runaway slave. He had done so repeatedly throughout the colonial era. He'd done so when, when some of his enslaved folks ran off with the British to fight in the American Revolution against Americans to get their freedom. So clearly this became, so I realized this actually wasn't odd. But it was an advertisement um, for me that helped me to understand who Judge was, what she looked like, or at least a description of her. We have no images uh, of her. She knew that the moment that she walked out of the president's mansion, that her status as a trusted house slave for the most powerful family would immediately come to an end. No longer would Judge be the favored slave of her mistress. And instead, she would be a fugitive. On Saturday, May 21st, Judge walked out of the president's house and never returned. Frederick Kitt, who was the household steward to George Washington, placed several ads um, in the newspaper. I was able to find um, two that ran repeatedly, the Claypool's Daily Advertiser and another one in the Philadelphia Gazette. Some of the language was similar for both ads. Absconded from the household of the President of the United States on Saturday afternoon, Oni Judge, and I should make a clarification here. Oftentimes you see her referred to as Oni Judge. Uh, and I argue that that was the diminutive of her name, like little Oni. I choose to call her Ona because that's the name she went by at the end of her life. So Oni, what you find in the records of Washington's um, estates uh, is what we see here in this runaway advertisement. A light mulatto girl, much freckled with very black eyes and bushy hair. She's of middle stature, slender and delicately made, about 20 years of age. The advertisement alerted slave catchers to judge's probable escape route, the Delaware River. And in his advertisement, they sent strong warning to anyone who worked on the docks of Philadelphia's busy port. Their assumptions were correct. The judge did escape the city by boat. And a combination of preparation, assistance from the free black community, her steely nerves, pushed this trusted slave woman to begin her life anew as a fugitive. And I don't, I don't want to sort of give everything away. I want you to buy the book and it makes a perfect gift for your friends. Um, so I won't, I won't talk too much about, um, about her escape and about, I think one of the more striking things about the book was this relentless pursuit George Washington literally pursued her up until three months before he died. I know. Up until September, October of 1799, there's correspondence from him to others, to family members who pursued her. And I think what's so incredible is that for years, for three years, 
Washington lived until December of 1799, he used his agents of the state, the Secretary of the Treasury, customs collectors, family members, to try and get her back, and they knew where she was. She made her way to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where she would remain a fugitive for more than 50 years. And as I said earlier, and in closing, she spent 50 years looking over her shoulder. She knew that she was the property of the Washingtons. It, had she, it didn't matter that she had fled north. So what the book tries to do is break down what a free north supposedly is, how fragile the lives were for black people, whether you were enslaved, a fugitive, or free. We know that from films like 12 Years a Slave, that your life was simply fragile, that freedom was not really freedom as long as slavery existed. So I asked that question, what did freedom really mean at this moment in time? She was enslaved. I also was sort of careful with how I, I the title that I chose for the book. I didn't want to use the word free or freedom because the reality was Ona Judge was never technically free. She was simply never caught. And her story, her life, this life of resistance is actually, it's so incredible, it's almost unbelievable, but it happened, and I'm honored and proud to be able to share it with you tonight, so thank you. Um, we're going to do a little bit of, um, I think, I, I know I talked a little too long, sorry, the pres professor thing jumped in. Um, we'll do a little bit of question and answer. I think we have microphones on the side, so if anybody has questions um, about the book, I, the book just came out, so I know that I'm not holding you responsible for reading it yet, but if you have questions, um, feel free to, to come forward or raise your hand. Thank you so much for such eloquently uh, told story. Um, the life of resistance is really what caught my attention. And uh, a question I have related to that is, uh, what do you think inspired her to going into that life of resistance? Uh, and I have to preface to say, around that time, there was uh, there was a lot of slavery going on around the world, especially in the Caribbean, where I'm from. And uh, there, was, uh, there were a lot of uh, revolutions. Uh, there mm -hmm. were a lot of movements uh, uh, mm -hmm. occurring around that, that time uh, that led to the uh, uh, Haiti being the first sure. uh, uh, s uh, nation to, be, sure. uh, 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 to go to revolution. Uh, so what, what, what are some of those things in your mind that inspired her to? That's a, that's a that? great question. And I'm glad you actually threw in Haiti because I argue that the Haitian Revolution, which won the independence for the first free black republic in the Western Hemisphere, influenced all people who were enslaved. They knew about it. They heard about it. They understood freedom could happen. Uh, I think aside from the fact that, that Ona knew she was, um, that her ownership was going to change, I argue that, you know, Enslaved people resisted all of the time. Simply surviving was resistance, right? To simply live was resistance. Uh, to deal with the loss of children, to work from sunup to sundown in the most terrible of conditions, and to survive was resistance. But I do think things like the Haitian Revolution the American Revolution, where the enslaved were given an opportunity to find freedom through the British, and also seeing other enslaved people escape from, from George Washington. These were things that influenced her, but I'd say the greatest influence was living here in Philadelphia, was seeing free black people sell their pepper pot soup and their 
fruit on the streets and uh, witnessing the, the building of Mother Bethel Church around the corner. These were things that Ona could see and feel and smell and touch. This fueled her resistance. She knew there was another life to be lived. And once she was exposed to it, she was compelled to pursue it no matter what. Hi, thank you for writing this book. Um, my question is, who was more preoccupied with Ona, Martha or George? <laughs> and was there any sexual yeah, overtones? Yeah, that's the question that always comes. Thanks for asking. You know, when I first, um, and it's a natural question, right? Because when we think about it, you know, the institution of slavery was based upon rape, forced breeding. We know the story of Thomas Jefferson and Annette Gordon-Reed did did the, the yeoman's work of pulling that apart and showing us um, about Jefferson's interactions. So when I first started this, I of course asked the same question like, why is he really pursuing her so much when there are so many other enslaved people at Mount Vernon? What's that all about? And so I was hoping, okay, well, I'm gonna find that moment that says that Washington had some kind of non-consensual relationship with Ona, but I never found it. And, you know, at first I was like, oh, you know, for a book, you know, sex, and he sells, but, but then sort of sitting with that, and as a scholar, it almost means more that I couldn't find that, that there is no documented proof that there was a kind of sexual assault or t attack between Ona and George, that almost made her story, her decision to find freedom, to go after freedom, more important, right? More uh, compelling, that it wasn't necessarily having a lascivious slave owner. I, you know, I don't wanna put George in the clear because I don't know is the answer. She never spoke to it, and I wasn't able to find any other accounts of a relationship between them. But it wasn't necessarily, at least I don't believe, a sort of lascivious attack against her that prompted her to run. It was her belief that she needed and should be free, that it was her right, and so she took it. Yes, ma'am. What do you think of the representation of Ona Judge at the President's House exhibit in Philadelphia right now? And if there's anything that you would do to change it, what would that be? Yeah. Um, so uh, let me say that um, I'm happy that there is a representation. And I know that a lot of people fought long and hard to make certain that there was a representation of the enslaved, right? That that wasn't gonna be something glossed over. I'll tell you just quickly, when I was watching, um, I guess it was the last um, campaign stop, or yeah, last campaign stop of Hillary Clinton in Philadelphia here with Barack Obama. I was watching from home and I'm watching, you know, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton and they're standing literally a stone's throw from the, where the president's house was. And I thought, oh my gosh, what a visual, right? To have the first African-American president, what I thought might be the first woman president. <laughs> and Ona Judge's house, not George's house, Ona's house, right? To have that visual was so um, just important and moving for me. So I'm, I'm thrilled that there is a representation, that the people who lived at that house who were enslaved are recognized, their names are on the wall. Um, I think there's always room for improvement and I'm happy to, to talk with anyone about that. Yes, sir. First, I, I, unfortunately I haven't had a chance to read your book. That's okay, I'm start tonight. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Did uh, Ona Judge, judge get uh, sent back and forth to Virginia uh, every
every six months to comply with the manumission law? Yeah, that's a great question about the manumission laws of the, the laws around emancipation here in Philadelphia. A couple years ago, I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times um, that appeared on President Today um, about George Washington. I, the, it was called George Washington Slave Catcher. I didn't pick the title. I didn't have sort of control over that because I actually wanted it to the article to focus more on ONA. But the laws in Pennsylvania stated, because Pennsylvania was one of the first states to begin to dismantle slavery, the law said if you were born on March 1st or afterwards, you could, 1780, you could only be held enslaved for up to 28 years. So by the time that Ona comes to, to Philadelphia, she's in the minority. The majority of black people are free, right? But the law also said that you could visit Pennsylvania. If you were a non-resident, you could bring your slaves, but you could only stay six months. And then after six months, if you overstayed your time limit, your slaves would be set free. So George quickly finds out that this was problematic. The attorney general visited him and said, look, my slaves ran off. They found out about the law. You might want to be careful. And in George's right, he writes this. These are all letters between uh, George Washington, his secretary, Tobias Lear, and Martha Washington, where he says, look, we're going to have to rotate our slaves. So they come up with this plan. I argue he doesn't break the law, but he breaks the spirit of the law, right? He rotates his slaves in and out of Pennsylvania, sending them back to Virginia. When that became too problematic, he would send them uh, across the river to Trenton and basically reset the clock on slavery. And this happened for six years. And so this was a sort of calculating rights. Washington writes, I prefer to keep this, um, uh, I prefer to keep this away from the public. I will deceive the public if necessary. This is Washington's writing, not mine, right? Yeah, and it, it wasn't even so much on the down low because people knew, and it was actually odd, somewhat strange to have Washington have a household with a significant number of enslaved people in a city that really was for the most part free. So Ona was in the minority. Another thing that I think prompted her resistance, she looked up and said, hey, Wait a minute, I'm the one that's, I'm the different thing here, and let me try to fix it. Any questions? I don't want to leave this side out. Yes, the microphone's coming to you. Um, it seems like it got something to do with um, the indentured slavery that the Southerners held on to. They wanted to force slavery, even though he was still in Philadelphia and he's free. So it seems like he wanted to have his own way because he's from the South. Yeah, I think that's a good point that Washington and, you know, I'm, not, I'm, 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 I'm no Washington biographer, but maybe I'm sort of becoming that and I, that wasn't my intention is what I'll say. Um, Washington's ideas about slavery do change over time, right? He was born into a slaveholding family. He had slaves some, from childhood, but he does sort of talk about his discomfort with slavery for financial reasons, for other reasons, uh, over the course of his life. And later on, he does sort of change his position, and it's, it's worth noting that in his will, he does state that all of his enslaved property, that property was to be set free upon the death of Martha. Martha realizes, you know, she doesn't want to sleep with one eye open for the rest of her life. She emancipates them quickly, right? But she never, <laughs> smart move. There were a couple of fires that were set off in the barns after George died. She was nervous. She wrote about it. She couldn't sleep. And smart. So she emancipates them early, but she never emancipates any of her slaves. And there's an argument about, oh, well, she couldn't really do that because they were part of a, a trust or an estate. And, well, you know, she found a way to emancipate Georgia slaves earlier. So I take issue with that. But I think what it shows is the difference between a husband and a wife over this issue of slavery. And I also argue that I think George Washington, um, the fact that he 
basically let go of his wealth after his death was an easier thing to do because he had no biological children. And so while we often sort of, you know, give him support, praise, for emancipating his enslaved men and women, I argue I don't know that he would have been so quick to do that if he had to give away his wealth and he had children who were there and expecting an inheritance of some sort. That is how wealth was passed down. And he did not have biological children to receive that wealth. So I think in some ways um, the decision was made a little easier for him. Yes. I'm wondering about the destination of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Mm. Uh, was there something special about New Hampshire? Why not have stayed in New York or in Boston or why not have gone on to Canada? Would it made a difference to her? I think that's a great question because it was one of the questions I asked was, you know, Portsmouth's a lovely place. I've spent a lot of time there, but I was like, Portsmouth? Like, what is that about? Um, why there? It's cold. Well, yeah. Um, but the reality is she couldn't go to New York. She'd lived there. She was a recognizable face. She was with Martha Washington all of the time. She would have been spotted, turned in quickly. And the same may have been true about Boston. There were a significant number of... Um, friends and, and connects that Washington had, is that they weren't necessarily safe spaces. And what Ona says, you know, the great thing about Ona is that she leaves behind these two interviews that appear in two abolitionist newspapers, one in 1845 and one in 1847, the Liberator in 1847, and she never names the names of her associates, of the people who help her. She's very clear to say it's the free black community that helps her, right? But she never, she says she didn't know where she was going, that they had kind of kept that location a secret in order to protect her, to protect themselves. And I think Portsmouth was enough of a port city that was growing at the end of the 18th century. There were direct ships. One of the things I was able to do was to track the ship that took her from Philadelphia to Portsmouth through the captain, his name was John Bull. She names him in uh, her interview because he was dead, and so therefore he couldn't be charged with any kind of federal crime of helping uh, or assisting a fugitive slave. But I was able to track the ship called the Nancy that she rides on um, to Portsmouth, and it was, it was a ship that was there. It was in port. It was ready to go. Um, and clearly there was a belief that John Bowles was someone who would at the very least turn a blind eye to a passenger like Ona and receive a little extra money on the side to, to take her to Portsmouth. And it was believed that she could remain, you know, in some kind of anonymity there. Now, what's funny is that when Ona gets to Portsmouth, there are more black people at Mount Vernon than there were in all of Portsmouth may still be true. I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's a lovely city. It is. Well, you know, it doesn't have a large black population. And so the reality is Ona is spotted quickly. I'm not going to tell you all because I want you to read the book. But she is spotted. And so there is something about the people of Portsmouth who make the decision not to turn her in, both black and white, right? A feeling of a sort of beginning of an, we won't call them abolitionists because it's sort of early for that, but a feeling of the, you know, the human bondage just isn't sort of sitting right for a variety of reasons, the beginning of a wage labor system, um, the moral and religious reasons. It ended up being the perfect place for her um, for a variety of reasons. Okay, there was a hand in the back, yes. Hi, this is such a wonderful talk and reading. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so I'm trying to reconcile Washington's decision to emancipate, but yet pursue his enslaved so heavily when they ran away. And I'm curious if he saw himself as somewhat of a benevolent owner, you know, one mm -hmm. that they should have been more ingratiated to, and perhaps he took it more as an insult, or mm -hmm. just trying to make sense of it in, in my head. That's a great question, because it also makes me, um, yes, the Washingtons believed they were benevolent. He writes. 
Uh, there was absolutely no cause for her to run off. Really? <laughs> All right, well, sure you see it that way, but, um, but you know, what I argue in the book is that it's not just George who's going after Ona. This is Martha. And in all of his letters with his elected, his official, appointed officials and uh, friends, he makes a point of saying, oh, my wife is very desirous of seeing her again. Oh, my wife can't find a replacement. Oh, so, you know, I think Martha was kind of giving him his marching orders. Go get my slave. She had no right to run away. She's mine. She messed up my decision to give her away to Eliza Custis Law. And, you know, Martha's kind of a little cold-blooded. Just she makes a decision when Ona runs off. She's still left with her granddaughter and needs help and assistance. And she makes the decision to give one of her slaves to Eliza Custis Law. And, and Ona's no longer there to be given away, so she chooses Ona's sister. That's cold, right? It's like, and in many ways, it makes me, as a scholar, sort of look through, of course, the documents that tell us what Martha thinks about slavery. Martha, um, at the end of, of George Washington's life, she burns all their correspondence. There are, there are like three remain existing documents between them, one recently found. But she was very clear that she wanted her private life kept private. George's writings, thank goodness, remain. Um, but I firmly believe that this was a husband and wife venture, that the two of them worked very hard to try to recapture the property. And the reality is George Washington was always cash-strapped. And if, if Ona ran off on his watch, he was financially responsible for reimbursing the estate of the Park Custis family. So there was an incentive to get her back financially, but I think it was far deeper than that. I think it's what you touched on, this idea of being a benevolent slave owner and as a president of the United States, the most important, powerful family, what did it mean that you couldn't control this one woman? And what did it mean about the future of slavery? That if the president could not keep his slaves in order, could not control them, and then couldn't depend upon allies and friends and family in the North to help send her back, well, there was a deeper problem about slavery in the nation. And it's at that this moment we see this sort of split between the North and the South become uh, even more prominent. So thank you. I think we're out of time. Thank you all.